Um, so uh, it's, it's great to see so many industry colleagues here. Um, I'm here to play the uh, curmudgeonly old video engineer. So despite what Marcus said, actually I'm standing up for IP to SDI. You know, how do we keep it at SDI? SDI is still here, it's still relevant, and uh, it's, it, it's still very much used in the industry. Um, today, uh, this morning, what is happening, I'm going to talk about um, uh, video and networks a bit. Uh, and go over some of the product offerings we've got at the moment, uh, which you can come and see in my little podium in the hallway out there. Um, uh, some of the reasons why SDI is still needed as a single, single uh, signal transport, uh, and, and uh, if we do have to step into the world of SDI over Ethernet, what does um, SIPT 2022 tell us as a standard about those things? Then they're going to talk about maybe a better option, something that Matt hinted at, uh, CWDM for video networks, coarse wave division multiplexing and some of the things that, some of the benefits that brings us. And then we're going to talk a little bit about contemporary monitoring options. You know, where should you be spending your money in terms of monitors? Uh, and whether there is a sensible um, set of values yet for buying into uh, UHD TV monitoring. I would suggest not quite yet. Um, but all these bullet points are, are, are meant to uh, take us along this road of, of, of video quality and, and how can we remain in, a, in an industry where we are uncompromising in our picture quality. Um, there's one manufacturer that we represent who uh, was giving a presentation a couple of months ago that I was at, and uh, they are entirely kind of end-to-end -end IP for video. And uh, he got very angry with the person from the BBC who was talking to me. He said, what the industry has to accept is that at some point, uh, frame accuracy and uh, those kind of things are just gonna fall by the wayside. We have to get away from those prejudices. And I thought, no, 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 that's not the industry I'm in. So SDI, still the best option for lots of things. Uh, 3 gigabits per second is a very, very high data rate. You don't get that over, over gigabit Ethernet. Uh, but if we think about what 3G uh, HDSDI can give us, it can give us 60 progressive frames per second as a maximum. Uh, at our typical resolution, 1920 by 1080, we can either be dealing with RGB or YCBCR colour spaces. We, we've got support for the, the DCI 2K raster, and, and, and that's kind of interesting, the way SDI is kind of lends itself into the digital cinema and way of working. It's uncompressed and it has zero latency. You know, as the, as the picture leaves the camera and arrives at the studio vision mixer, it really is instantaneous and we're not worried about lip sync and things like that. But 3G is a monstrous data rate and it gets even more monstrous when you start thinking about 4K and what that means. And I know you film people, it's not proper 4K, it's only 390, 3980 by 2160 raster, uh, but we'll call it 4K from now on. You know, what are you going to do? It's, it's ultra high definition television. Now there's one manufacturer who is pushing 6G and 12G products, as they call it, and you know and love them already. You've probably got lots of their gear already. Um, but again, these are monstrous data rates to be pushing down a coaxial cable. Um, but in its 6G, its 6G variety, uh, 3980 by 2160 is limited to 30 progressive frames per second at a maximum. It's limited to YCBCR color space and it's limited to 10 bits. So it's almost like we've got some of the bits of the 4K puzzle, but by no means all of them. Now, of course, more professional outfits, Mr. Sonny, uh, Snell and Wilcox, the BBC, people who do serious kind of 4K coverage of things like the World Cup, uh, they're actually taking a different uh, tack to this. And this is the, the sort of the current state of things if you're running uh, an OBU truck uh, with a, a nice, smart Sony MBS 8000 series vision mixer. You split the signal into four, and, and there you go. Very simple to understand, you've got four links, quad link HDSDI, uh, and each link is a quarter of the picture. That's fantastic, until you think about your lovely Sony MVS vision mixer. Four ME vision mixer is now nobbled down to being a single ME vision mixer, or at best a two ME vision mixer, because you can do some other tricks. Uh, and it's a very expensive way of doing it. There's another flavor of quad link SDI, uh, sometimes referred to as the 2SI system, where instead of splitting the picture um, overall into four quads, we split each four-way block of pixels into four blocks. So we wind up with four quad, with a quad SDI signal, uh, each one which looks remarkably like an HD signal. This is the kind of uh, um, standard that people like Ross are beginning to support. And it brings some benefits in as much as you don't have to down raise things if you just want to have an SDI, an HD SDI viewing copy of something. But, you know, uh, 4K over SDI is a challenge. 
And, and so we kind of think, well, you know, as, as in all area, other areas of our industry, we look to IP to see if commoditization and network technology brings us an answer. And there is a standard for this, SIPTI 2022, which was first introduced eight years ago. And it covers several styles, several types, several methods of doing video IP transport over Ethernet. And um, the first uh, sort of iteration, section four of the standard, uh, talks about MPEG-2 transport streams in both standard and high definition. Uh, uh, but the thing that everybody looks to nowadays is, is section six, which talks about uncompressed video and how we put that uncompressed HDSDI through switches and things like that. The other, the other bits of your infrastructure, like commodity, CAT6 cabling, or maybe CAT7, or even CAT8 nowadays cabling, and your network switches. But we'd still like uncompressed production pictures, we'd still like zero latency, and we would still like less dependency on the IT department. So think about your, your favorite expletive that you put before the words IT department. Every engineer does it, I've heard it many times, and it's because we live in different worlds. Uh, you know, the considerations of IP and networking are different to what we like in video. And we would say that a better solution, if it's appropriate, is CWDM, Course Wave Division Multiplexing. Using your fibre infrastructure, be that within a building, across a campus, or between cities, uh, to stack up multiple wavelengths onto a single cable and send those down the fibre. And they might be videos, they might be networks, they might be MADI audio streams, they might be lots of things. But single mode fibre is a fantastic thing because uh, signals can go unamplified and unassisted, 80 kilometres. Uh, but as this map shows, uh, you know, these are all the cables that, that, that leave the United Kingdom and travel towards the Americas to form the backbone of the internet. Um, you know, there's all, almost no limit to how far things can go down a single mode fibre with suitable iridium doped uh, um, boosting amplifiers. Now, until very recently, maybe five years ago, CWDM endpoints, the technology that allows us to amalgamate multiple wavelengths onto a single fibre, were very expensive. They were kind of the province of telcos and telco size budgets. But the last few years, um, we're starting to see products now that allow uh, handling of, of, of this kind of fibre traffic in much, much more keenly priced, much more commodity type applications. And the, the product that we represent is, is made by a Norwegian firm called Barnfind, who are kind of recently to the television and film world, that, that, that their background is in oil and gas exploration. And apparently it's not uncommon to have to have uh, more than 100 cameras on an oil platform, uh, and the poor operator who's having to monitor all those cameras to make sure that valve hasn't blown out, to make sure you know, that safety feature hasn't been compromised. Typically, they will be mirrored back on shore by one of their colleagues who's watching all the same camera feeds that they're watching. And to get you know, 150 camera feeds back to shore in beautiful HD can be a challenge if you've got to send a single camera down each core of a multi-core fiber. And so Barnfine kind of comes to the rescue in that situation. And guess what? It's got huge application in our environment as well. So there's the basic product. Unfortunately, we can't show you the metal today because uh, it's proved so popular as a demo that uh, it's, it's currently sitting uh, at, uh, at Arsenal, providing the backbone between the Emirates Stadium and Highbury House where their post-production goes on. Um, but there's the basic product. It's a one new box. It has 16 SFP holes and contained within the box is a 32 squared data agnostic router. Doesn't care whether it's routing uh, asynchronous data signals like fiber channel or ethernet, or could be synchronous uh, broadcast signals like SDI or MADI or, or AES or HDMI, or whatever else you care to think about. And unbeknownst to me, uh, well, I only you know, found out a few months ago, there are SFPs, there's a video SFP, video in and video out, 3G HDSDI. There are SFPs that cover most signal standards. Barnfine manufacture quite a lot of them, but they're not you know, fussy about whose SFPs you use. If you buy one of their chassis with the 16 SFP holes, you can populate it with whichever SFPs you like, so long as they conform to the MDA standard for SFP, which apparently most of them do. So you might want to populate your chassis with, with lots of video beards, with lots of video SFPs, because today I want my chassis to be a video router. But as things get, you know, things move on and SDI becomes less and less of a thing, maybe we move towards HDMI because that's how we're going to do 4K. Or maybe you want your switcher to become more and more a data type switcher. And just by throwing away those relatively inexpensive couple hundred euros each SFPs, 
you can rebuild your router as you need to. Now, as well as supporting all those signal standards, they also support CWDM, and you can get SFPs that support uh, the standard set of CWDM wavelengths. Now, there's a diagram that shows you um, typically how those wavelengths uh, sort of pack across the spectrum, uh, and CWDM is the passive mode version of the technology. They also do DWDM, dense wave division multiplexing, where we can pack up to 192 wavelengths onto a single fiber. And remember, this is all without compression. This is all without um, uh, anything more than a couple of nanoseconds worth of latency. Now, the thing that struck me when we first started looking at this as a product to carry was that as engineers, we're very familiar with looking at a cable and saying, oh yes, this is a, this is a high quality piece of coax, and it's got 2.5, well, 4.5 gigahertz written on the jacket. I know that I can stuff three gigahertz per second down that cable. Or look at this piece of Cat6 cable. It's got 300 megahertz written on the jacket. I know that with the channel packing that Ethernet uses, we can send gigabit Ethernet down this. But when we get to fiber cables and we start talking about uh, them, it seems that we've abandoned talking about bandwidths of the cable. And we talk about wavelengths. We talk about 13, 10 nanometers for single mode, 850 nanometers for multi mode. But that obscures the fact that a 13, 10 nanometer wavelength offers us a bandwidth in the hundreds of terahertz. So that, that little three gigabit per second video signal really is a drop in the bucket. And this is how we can achieve these truly spectacular multiplex um, uh, systems of being able to pack many, many wavelengths onto a single fiber. Now, being, a, uh, being an engineer, as soon as we got our demo optical multiplexes and demultiplexes, I took the lid off them to have a look at how they worked. And, and look at that, that really is it's a passive component with a bunch of prisms in. And so we've got our common uh, fibre connector there, a single single mode connector there. And we've got 16 ins and outs. They can be ins or they can be outs, doesn't matter. And they're all combined onto that single fibre through a bunch of just prisms. It's all kind of beautiful optical engineering. And that piece there is, is what allows us to take all those multiple wavelengths out of the Vodafone chassis, put them onto a single fibre, and send them to the next building or to the next city. Um, and just you know, to illustrate how commoditized and how, how economical this now is, this 16-way optical multiplexer demultiplexer is sub thousand pounds. Remarkable. I mean, if you'd gone to you know, Rydal Media on that two years ago, you know, every single endpoint for their CWDM solution is 30,000 pounds. Now, here's the other sort of slice of the pie. Here's the other end of the equation. This is the Vaughan Mini, as they're called. And this one here is a video Vaughan Mini. It's got two BNCs and an SFP hole that you can't see. Uh, and, and if you, for example, had maybe a big machine room and a couple of streets away you had a little townhouse where you wanted to have maybe six edit suites, you don't particularly want to have another router in the townhouse. All you want is to be able to pluck off the various wavelengths you're sending from your main machine room and turn them into video I.O. or fiber channel I.O. or ethernet I.O. And you do that with these little boxes here, which, you know, guess what? They look a little bit like little black magic or AJA boxes, and they are priced to compete with them. So that's the, that's the kind of the very cheap thing that gets cable tied to the back of the monitor in the edit suite, and allows you to pluck off the wavelengths you're interested in, turn them back into the signal types you're interested in. Now, Barnfind appreciate that um, we don't all want to build a, a, a router, you know, some wild varying type. And so they offer several variations on Facebook. This is, this is the one we have as our demo product. Um, again, it's got 16 SFP holes, but this one comes ready equipped with some BNCs for input and output, and an um, optical multiplexer built in. You can have 16 SFPs and another 16 SFPs, give you a full 32-way SFP router, or some SFPs and just BNCs on the top, or well, there's variations with AES and MADI, um, if you don't want to have to brew your own by putting SFPs in there. Um, but that's a, that's a very typical example of, of, of the product. And we found it to be a real problem solver. Um, there's one particular customer who um, really needed an Ethernet crosspoint router. They're big in the digital cinema space, and the way digital cinema encryption works between servers and projectors is that the projectors don't like to see more than one server. And if they do, they will periodically attach to the wrong server, and suddenly all the screens go blank. But with an Ethernet crosspoint router, where Ethernet traffic is not allowed to migrate between segments, this suddenly goes away. And so for them, that's a problem solver. Integrating it into your machine room as a, an expander for your router, so that maybe you've taken over a new floor of your building, and you don't want to go to the expense of running copper cables to all those rooms up there. Drop a single fibre down, 
And for a very comparable price, you can just put all the signals you want to get up to the fifth floor of your building onto a fiber and pluck them off at the other end. An expander across campus or between buildings or, or even between towns, very, very possible. Failover and, and, and disaster recovery between sites. That's one of the models that, that, that our friends at Arsenal are exploring between Highbury House and the Emirates uh, Stadium. Pop-up post, uh, you know, we talked about that a lot last year. I think the phrase has gone out of favour, but it's still relevant. Dark fibres are very cheap. Um, uh, level 3 um, will do dark fibres between buildings in London for, for only a few hundred pounds a month. And freeing yourself from the tyranny of the IT department. Again, it's something that our friends at Arsenal have, have discovered, that their DVS Venice uh, data recorder video server, um, which they keep in the stadium, they'd previously not been able to use it to the, the best of its ability. Uh, and it was only when we were able to um, make it look as if it was on the same network in Highbury House as everything else, as their ISO and all their other equipment, that suddenly the thing became super useful because we'd been able to extract it from the clutches of the firewall that the IT department had between the stadium and Highbury House. So again, you know, what's your favourite clenched teeth expletive that you put before IT departments? So, that's all a bit of talk about, about transport and maintaining quality at the physical level. Um, but unless we can analyse uh, picture quality uh, and, and really know what we're talking about, it's all kind of for nothing. And so the next thing I want to talk to, talk to you about, and I'll, I've shown a few people um, outside of the corridor already, is the SRI visualiser, which is this piece of test equipment that we're, that we're, we're showing to people. And uh, there's a fantastic quote by Lord Kelvin. When you can measure what you are speaking about and express it in numbers, you can know something about it. But when you cannot measure it, when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meagre and unsatisfactory kind. It may be the beginnings of knowledge, but you have scarcely in your thoughts advanced to the stage of science. Fantastic, Lord Kelvin. I and mean, actually, Lord Kelvin said a load of really stupid things. In, in 1896, he said, uh, in, a, in a presentation to the Royal Society, he said, uh, I have not the smallest molecule of faith in aerial navigation other than ballooning. And that was a paper entitled, Heavier than air flying machines are impossible. Uh, and then in 1900, uh, at a presentation of the British, British Association for the Advancement of Science, he said, there is nothing new to be discovered in physics now. All that remains is more and more precise measurement. And then again in 1896, that must be the humdinger of the year for Lord Kelvin, he said, Symmetri symmetrical equations are good in their place, but the vector is useless and has never been of the slightest use to any creature. So clearly he didn't anticipate um, compressed video. It was not on his roadmap. But we have to think, well, why, uh, you, you know, well, what are the, the, the drivers of, of, of video quality analysis? Well, obviously, back in the day when everything was analog, we had to worry about voltages, because voltages related to picture brightness and colour saturation and things like that. And then we moved on to digital video, and, 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 and the physical transport stream became less of an issue. But we were worrying about pixels and lines and things like that, because nowadays we have to worry about macro blocks and groups of pictures. And so colour bars are almost pointless, they're almost worthless to the modern engineer. But we do still need test signals that stress the system. Uh, you know, colour bars, their job was to, was to represent colours at the extremities of the gamut of the system. And if a, if a DA wasn't able to transmit saturated yellow, we'd see it, and, and the colour bar signal would warn us of the, the, the fact that we had something wrong in the pan. Uh, but actually, today's requirements are much more uh, involved. Uh, we have the challenge of compression encoders. What are they doing to our pictures? Um, field cadence problems, both in the lunar and the chroma path. Uh, sync errors, you know, every piece of equipment has a frame store inside it. You know, my long-suffering wife and kids, they all know exactly what lip sync errors look like now because I shout so much at the television when I'm watching the news. Um, uh, and ideally, we want to do all this. We want to do all this analysis with a, a well-trained operator and a monitor. We don't want to have to dig out 10,000 pound Tektronics and get the, uh, the super expensive engineer to get off his backside from drinking his cup of tea in the workshop. And so the thing that, that we use for all of that is this test signal called the SRI visualizer. It's an animated test signal and uh, it's available both as a, as a file download, you buy a file license and so you can download it as uncompressed QuickTime or DPS or something like that and drop it in at the head of your workflow, drop it in as just as you're ingesting into Avid, and see what happens through your post-production or your, your deliverable uh, process, and get a real feel for what damage is being done to the pictures. So let's just play it a little bit, and you can see what it looks like. There we go. So you can't, you can't hear the best bit about it, which is the blinking sync tick.
But you see the flying white dot at the bottom, which is a luma dot when it goes in that direction, and a chroma dot when it comes back in this direction. As it passes the big graticule in the centre, you get a, a single frame tick, and you'll notice that the background also pulses at the same moment. So that's one way of, of, of looking at pictures across a busy gallery or busy machinery and judging whether you've got um, uh, uh, a problem with your sync. So um, I'm actually going to move on to some uh, close-ups now of the various bits. So you would have noticed, well you might not have noticed, but on one side of the, uh, uh, of the, of the main block there, there was this piece here which is a, a rotating 10-bit color wheel. Uh, and so ordinarily you can barely notice the fact that it's moving. But if your video processor, be it a compression encoder or a, or a new codec you're trying out in your, your, your non-linear editor, if that's inadvertently nodded your pictures down to 8-bit, which happens a lot, uh, all of a sudden your, your rotating color wheel becomes very jagged and very obvious. Uh, and so something that would be the very devil to notice on camera pictures suddenly becomes very clear on this. We've got, you will have noticed, well you may not notice, but in, in the color bar portion in the center there's this kind of twisted portion of, of the green magenta transition. And if you've got 420 or 411 pictures that have been upsampled, the, the edges become very blurry and indistinct. Similarly, on the chroma wheel here, we've got, um, we've got a chroma ripple that expands from the, from the lower left up to the upper right. And essentially, it shows us where we run out of resolution in the chroma domain. So if we've got lovely 444 pictures, either dual link or 3G 444 pictures, the chroma wheel makes it all the way to the top. 422 pictures, um, the chroma wheel should make it up to the top in the, in the vertical direction, but will run out of oomph and only make it halfway along in the horizontal direction. Similarly, 411 pictures will run out there, and 420 pictures will run out there. But the beauty of this test signal is that if your, if your lovely 444 or 420 pictures have been downsampled to 411 inside a compression encoder, it generates reflections coming back down the axes and immediately your eyes drawn to it and you can see that you've got a problem. Again, you'd never see it on camera pictures or on colour bars. There's some, some range and some colour space error facilities. We've got a complete set of ST303 chroma chips and if you're worried about um, colour imagery or colour processing errors over and above um, the luminance and uh, grayscale, uh, these are well-defined colour values and they're in the manual but you can find them on Wikipedia as well. And if you point your colorimeter at those, those chips, you should be able to get a measurement and see exactly what your path or your monitor is doing to the pictures. We have a set of plus scales down in the blacks that run from um, uh, uh, neg four all the way up to plus four. Uh, and, and so you can really see if a, if a compression encoder is starting to bite into the black parts of the picture where it shouldn't be. Similarly, we have it in the white end of the spectrum as well, um, 97 up to 107%. And so you should really be able to see those, those first two transitions. You may not see the last transition because 107% it's within a monitor or an encoder's remit to chop that up if it wanted to. This is one of my favourites. This is the, um, the REC709, REC601 decode error indicator. If you can see a flashing grey spot inside each of, those each of those squares there, you know that your pictures are being decoded with the same uh, chroma matrix that they were made with. But if you lose one of them, I always forget which way around this is. Uh, you know that your, your beautiful REC709 pictures have at some point been decoded with the REC601 numbers. And you might think to yourself, well, where on earth does that happen? It happens more often than you think. Some models of JVC model to do it. QuickTime does it an awful lot, depending on which version of QuickTime you're using. And so it's, it's the kind of thing that an eagle-eyed colorist would spot, but a, uh, you know, a half-asleep engineer wouldn't. So there's some other things. So there's, there's a great, there's a great scale which um, uh, goes down by a single stop, by 6 dBs per division. And we've got a saturation patch as well, so we can put our monitor into blue check mode and make sure our monitor is saturated correctly. We've got some resolution tests as well. Um, these two uh, pieces here extend to the Nyquist limit in both the, in, in both the vertical and, and, and horizontal directions. Um, and when we've got sub um, HD resolution, or whatever resolution you're rendering out at, uh, you see aliasing start to creep down the, 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 the chart head. We've got these reference uh, images here for skin tones. And, you know, you're always feeling a little bit uncomfortable the fact that it's three lovely looking women, but you know, maybe the middle one should have been a, sort of an elderly broadcast engineer perhaps. But um, uh, there's a little Easter egg contained there. If you, if you look at her on a 4K monitor, and you can tell that she's wearing contact lenses, but you can't see it in HD, which is rather splendid. 
The real, the real powerful bit of this is the compression multiverse test. So the compression multiverse has lines of TV resolution along the, uh, the x-axis, along the horizontal axis, and perceived bit depth along the vertical axis. And we have a moving compression grating uh, that runs up through each one. And so, in a very real sense, when something's gone through a compression encoder, you essentially just lose grating up here. And so, you could talk to somebody at the other end of a satellite link, and you could say to them, OK, tell me how many boxes have we lost up here? Where's the last square you can see? And then if you go and look in the manual, you can tell exactly the PSNR rating of your pictures, which is very important if you've got a, uh, a service level agreement with a satellite provider. And if you didn't have something like this, You'd have to have access traditionally to the uncompressed pictures, the compressed pictures, and a very expensive Roman Schwartz compression meter. Temporal tests, we've got a few things that show problems in the time domain. And we've got a little time code window, which if it's, if it's been set to render for interlaced pictures, we get a semi curl one on the even fields and a curl one on the odd fields. We have this thing called the lava lamp, which is um, a chroma channel on this side and a luma channel on this side, travelling up and it's rendered to be optically smooth, doubling in speed for every major um, uh, graduation on the background. And there was a, a job I was on where we were taking a feed from an OB, and, and if I tell you it was at the launch of the London Eye, you can figure out how long ago it was. And, and the compressor, sorry, the, the, the frame synchronizer that, that they were sending the pictures through had a fault whereby every fifth field in the V channel, in the red color difference channel, would, would, would repeat a field. And that was, I mean, you couldn't really see it on locked off shots. And on moving shots, you got a bizarre red fringing that kind of came and went as the camera moved. And it was the very devil to discover what was causing the problem. With this, we could have, we could have told them about it in, in, in a few minutes. We've also got the, we've already talked about that, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the lip sync tick. Uh, but the other nice thing about, about that is that, um, if you have a uh, field dominance error, field one and two reversed, uh, the, the dot becomes two dots. It's just very obvious. Again, you often miss that on an avid monitor, which is a, which is a, a progressive GUI monitor. Uh, and, and you even might not spot it on a video monitor unless you've got a moving shot. But to be able to see it immediately is nice. And in one direction it's a luma dot, in the other direction it's a chroma dot. So it's, it's very, very, very usable. There's some other tests. And in fact, if I, if I, if I go to the... Um, in fact, I play the uh, visualizer, so we'll talk about it while it's, while it's doing its thing. <coughs> um, we've got moving pixel marks um, at the extremities of the frame. So whatever resolution you've rendered this out, SD, HD, you know, 720, 1080, or even 2K PCI resolution, or if you've got the more recent version of the box, uh, 4K up to, um, up to 60p, um, it marks the first and last lines and the first and last pixels with a moving mark. But it also does it to mark the various different aspect ratios. So if you're having to crop for 4x3, or the, the um, uh, DCI resolutions, you know, for scope <coughs> and flat DCI resolutions, you can see exactly whether you're cropping to the right um, uh, uh, pixel marker or not. There's a few other things in there. You'll notice, if you come and look at it um, afterwards during coffee, that there's video noise in these squares, and it starts at neg 27 dB midpoint uh, on that column, and it goes down by 3 dBs as it comes out, so this is a bit more noisier than this, and that's a bit more noisier than that. But it's a calibrated um, video uh, noise, which if you were setting up a compression encoder, uh, and the first thing typically you do is set the noise core, uh, you know, looking at it on a, on, a, on, a, on a waveform monitor, you can see exactly where your noise core is biting into the video noise. Again, very, very useful. So, as, I, as I've said, it's available both as a, a file license, which you can download to drop in at the start of your workflow, and the file license licenses you for a whole premises. So it licenses for your studio centre, for your post-production facility, uh, for where, wherever you might be working, your outside broadcast truck or whatever. Or you can buy it as a, as a hardware appliance, which is what we're showing at the back there, the, the, the TG100 hardware. There's now a TG400, which does 4K up to 60p, either over HDMI or over Quadlink 3G. Uh, it comes with, there's the little remote application that allows you to talk to it and change uh, test signals. It comes with uh, a couple of dozen test signals, both in the audio and the video domain. And really is a very competent, very good replacement for a Tektronix and TG700 uh, signal generator. In fact, 
couple of weeks ago, well, 10 days ago, I was doing the, um, the big screen feed to Arsenal for the FA Cup, because Arsenal invite people to the stadium, about 30,000 fans come and watch it on big screens. And we had four of these giant monitors, they're 15 metres from corner to corner, they're the biggest LED monitors you could hire in Europe. And so I thought, fantastic, I'll put the visualiser up on one of the big monitors and see how good it looks. And I have to say, it looked awful. Those LED monitors are not great for video monitoring. If you're thinking of kind of stadium level grading, it's a no-no. <laughs> and in fact, you know, it came as no surprise to me, towards the end of the game, uh, Arsenal were doing well, 4-0 uh, four, four up to Villa, and there was a pitch invasion. And there were smoke bombs, a steward was stabbed, and it was, it was mayhem. And I, I'm sure, in no small part, the poor image quality of those monitors. <laughs> But, you know, thinking about giant monitors, we now have to think about regular edit suite size monitors. And uh, the one we're showing, uh, which we've recently become the UK reseller for, is Bowman, American manufacturer. Um, very big in America, and particularly broadcasters, but almost unknown in Europe. Um, and we would say they compare exceptionally well against Flanders, against Sony, in that kind of £5,000 range for a 25-inch OLED monitor. Or less. Or less, as our sales director tells us. Um, and uh, you know, if we, we put it up against the Flanders CS250, which I see a lot, and is a fine and solid monitor. I calibrate them a lot because I do a lot of monitor calibration. And the Sony uh, PVMA250, again, another solid choice. And um, I think it represents fantastic value for money. Uh, Boland also do a, a variety of larger and smaller monitors. They do a 55-inch 4K model. I think they've got a bigger 4K monitor. I mean, a 96-inch 4K model. I mean, uh, heavens. Um, but the nice thing about Bowman is they have a very complete set of extra features in there. Audio meters, time code, waveform monitors. Um, and the real clincher for me, the thing that, the, the thing that makes these better, uh, particularly than Sony, is their RGB separation, their RGB performance. Now, I said I was going to maintain my role as the grumbling uh, old broadcast engineer, throw up some equations, and we're going to talk to you about these a bit later. But Rec 709 states how we turn uh, RGB that comes out of the camera or whatever else is making the pictures into YCVCR. You'll remember that YCVCR is the, is the correct way of saying YUV. You know, very lazy engineers say U and V, but uh, we're going to say CV and CR because that's technically correct. And, and technically co correct is the best kind of correct. Um, but you could, if you wanted to, spend all day flipping between RGB and YCVCR and no image quality is lost, no resolution changes. It's only when we then subsample the CB and the CR channels, the two color different channels, down to half resolution. We start getting the benefits of, of, of what 422 brings for us because our, you know, visually we see less detail in the color space than we do in the detail space. But that's by the by. Um, the thing I really want you to take away from this is that our luminance scale, our gray scale performance is entirely dependent on how well our reds, greens and blues track with each other. So here's a... Uh, Here's, here's a monitor, well here's the profile of a monitor I did recently in a big name grading suite in Soho and I won't tell you anymore, I won't tell you the name of the monitor or whose grading suite it was but we see here an idealised uh, luminance performance from, from black all the way to white and this is of course is post uh, the gamma correction of, 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 of the system so this is a linearised version of what is really a gamma corrected model and um, Charles Pointer has a lot to say about, about constant luminance um, uh, but you can see that actually the measured RGB off the front of this monitor, uh, and remember the RGB is all added together to make our luminance, the, the tracking of the RGB is appalling across the grayscale. You can kind of get it right in the blacks, and in fact, if I've gone all the way up to the top, the blue actually recovers and gets up there. So peak white and deep blacks, I can get the colours correct. But all the intermediate colours, all the intermediate grayscale that is, is made up by the red, green and blue is, is terrible. Uh, you know, and back in the days of, of CRTs, that just wasn't an issue because CRTs, um, analog devices, electron guns, phosphors, all that stuff, so long as you're not driving the thing out of its range, uh, they are by their very nature entirely linear. And the shadow mask in the monitor means that there's no RGB crosstalk within the display surface unless your five year old has taken a magnet and put it on the front of the monitor, then you see RGB crosstalk. But so long as your monitor is right, then linearity is almost not a worry. Now this is uh, the same uh, uh, profile done on the front of a Boland uh, BBB25. In fact, it's the model we've got out there. Um, and what this tells us, this doesn't really tell us anything about Boland having discovered some fantastic way of manufacturing display panels. What this tells us is that internally Boland's got a 3D lookup table and they've profiled and corrected their panel before it left the factory. 
And that's one of the real value adds that they, they bring. Flanders do the same. Flanders have a, a 3D LUT inside their monitors and they do a very similar thing. And so, you know, at some point, Sony are going to have to kind of wake up to the fact that, that the linearity of OLED panels is not as good as it should be. Here's a, uh, here's a, um, uh, uh, the, the, the cube of the colour imagery of that bow on the panel. So the, 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 the cube you can see there, and I'll have um, LightSpace CMS running on my laptop after coffee, um, is, is the, 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 the gamut of this monitor. And all these coloured dots within the cube are Rec. 709. They're the, they're, the, they're the Rec. 709 colour space, and you can see they're very, very well contained. There's a lot of space. You know, as we approach the limits of the, the gamut of the monitor, there's enough space to realise that this monitor is, is more than capable of better than Rec. 709 performance. And um, just really as a, as a, as a sort of a, a by the by, uh, if you want us to come and sort of calibrate your monitors and, and profile things for you. Um, where, 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 you know, this is the sort of standard set that we use, Lightspace CMS for analysis and a Klein K10A Pro for, for, for doing the, uh, the looky looky. And um, you know, in a lot of cases, a very cheap and cheerful AJA 500 pound LUT will allow you to entirely tame the monitor to get it right into the proper Rec. 709 color space for your um, high, high definition television workflow. So, Having said all that about, about HD monitors and, and what the state of the industry is for regular TV production, you have to kind of think a little bit about 4K and what's coming down the 4K roadmap. All the, all the monitor manufacturers have got a, a UHD TV roadmap. Um, and, and you see kind of things that are obviously aimed at the TV industry with the UHD TV resolution, and you see other things that are, are largely derived from computer displays. Um, but Panasonic, TV Logic, Sony, Flanders, Bowen, they've all got skin in the game. The best 4K production one drives in so far is the Sony X300. But interestingly, Dolby is yet to replace their great display, the PRM uh, 4220. And so that will be very interesting because Dolby are quite invested in the high dynamic range way of doing things. So 4K monitoring, perhaps it's a bit too soon. Um, uh, you know, there's our, our, our lovely old uh, CIE 1931 chromaticity charts. And the, the inner triangle is, is Rec. 709. The medium triangle is the P3 DCI colour space. And then Rec. 2020 is our, our much yearned for um, ultra high definition colour space. And it might be ready by the year 2020, who knows? Um, and of course, you know, we could talk a little bit about XYY colour space as well, but, but that's probably beyond the remit of today. But the thing about all uh, the, 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 the nascent, the early offering 4K monitors is that they get the resolution right, but they don't get any of these other things right. You know, no monitor yet supports the high dynamic range we'd like to see, uh, and no monitor supports greater than 60 frames per second. Well, there may be, there may be a domestic monitor that can do 120, I don't know, but nothing in the broadcast space. So, really, just to finish off, you know, your, uh, your commercially old video engineer, um, come to the back and, and I'll show you Boland, we've got the monitor there. Uh, Lightspace CMS, which is how we do our colour analysis and, 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 and building LUTs. Uh, the SRI Visualizer, we've got the hardware version uh, working away, feeding the Boland monitor. And also takeaways and documentation about Boland.